When looking at BlackBerry and reflecting on their story, I would say that it's kind of embarrassing, maybe even scary, to think that something so common and so successful can fall so fast. Here's what I mean. Up until about a decade ago, a BlackBerry cell phone was considered to be one of the coolest, most high-tech items that you can own. That's how I saw it anyway, and I don't think I'm alone. Back me up in the comments if you felt the same way. I mean, they had that iconic look that included the full keyboard, which is a big part of what made it so appealing. It's actually how they got their name. The keys on the early BlackBerry devices were spaced out and had this slanted oval shape that looks strikingly similar to the little circles on an actual BlackBerry. Plus, it's a very quick and definite word with those hard B sounds, so it fit nicely with their image. It was considered to be a business person smartphone, revolutionizing the way business was done with their email capabilities and later on, BlackBerry Messenger. Some of the biggest celebrities of the time were known for their BlackBerry phone, including Kim Kardashian, and Katy Perry, and even President Barack Obama. And I was the first president to have a BlackBerry. Years pass, <laughs> and no one else has BlackBerry. <laughs> He's right when he says that. The simplest way to show how much these phones have fallen, I think, would be to look at how many of them were sold each year. And this is where it gets embarrassing. Worldwide, sales were climbing every year, leading up to 2010 or 2011, when they peaked at around 50 million of them. Then, they slipped into a landslide, until they fell almost as low as the 1 million mark in 2016. That year, BlackBerry announced that the company would stop making the phones altogether, and the production of the hardware would be licensed to other companies, mainly the Chinese electronics company TCL. But they've since lost the license in 2020. This company, Onward Mobility, now has the rights, but I promise, there is not much happening when compared to how things were. So today, I want to take a look at this company, how they came to be, how they got so big, and ultimately, where things went wrong. It's kind of weird, because the company company behind the BlackBerry phone was actually called Research in Motion through most of their existence. They changed the company name to BlackBerry in 2013, once the popularity of the BlackBerry phone had already started to fall. Uh, anyway, the main guy behind Research in Motion was Mike Lazaridis. When he was five years old, he immigrated with his parents from Turkey to Canada, which would explain why Research in Motion is a Canadian-based company, though most of their success has been in the U.S. market. In 1984, when he was 23 years old, with only a few credits remaining, he dropped out of his electrical engineering program at the University of Waterloo to start a company with his longtime friend and classmate, Doug Fragan. That company didn't have much focus in the beginning, sort of just accepting various engineering contracts. Their first big one was for General Motors. They were paid $600,000 to design this LED sign that showed messages to their workers on the assembly line. Well, eventually, one of these contracts was with a telephone company called Rogers, where they did some kind of work with their messaging network. It led them down the path of wireless communications where they continued on to manufacture wireless radio modems, and in 1997, they introduced the interactive pager. However, the A in the name is the at symbol, so I don't know if you want to try to pronounce it that way. It was a two-way pager. It allowed you to wirelessly receive and send messages. Their belief was that the professionals using the traditional one-way pagers would be willing to pay $675 to upgrade to this one, and in many cases, they were right. Within the year, inter at Kitiv pagers took over the majority of their business. In 1998, they had an initial public offering that raised over $100 million that was used to help fill their back orders of $100 million worth of pagers that they were struggling to fill. Their revenue more than tripled that year to over $20 million, but all of this was just the beginning because early the next year, something special happened when Research in Motion released their first ever BlackBerry device. The BlackBerry 850 is the original, and it was more attractive because it had email capabilities. Thanks to the connected wireless network, you can now read and send emails on the go. To do that away from a computer was amazing technology at the time. By 2001, the 850 and the more powerful 857, which looks more like the BlackBerry we know, had replaced those interactive pagers to become the new majority of their business. Though I should make it clear that these initial models did not function as a phone. The first true BlackBerry cell phone was the 
5810 introduced in 2002 and was criticized pretty heavily for the fact that it didn't have a built-in microphone or speaker, which seems odd for a cell phone. To use that feature, you had to plug in a headset with a microphone attached. It did come with it, but it was inconvenient. Especially when the phone's ringing and you have to rush to find the headset and plug it in in time. I mean, these people must have been conditioned to panic every time they heard the phone ring. But still, when you combine the communication of the cell phone and the email with the organizing features it offered, like a calendar and a dress book, this was like the ultimate phone for the business professional. That's who they were trying to attract, so their first national ad campaign consisted of placing ads in business and technology publications. Most of their sales were not coming from individuals, but rather companies who provided them to their employees. Specifically, technology companies like Dell, or banking companies like Merrill Lynch, or even the US government was using Blackberry phones. Along the way, they did start to break out into the general public. Like I said, all the celebrities were using them, making them look cool, and the Blackberry Messenger helped as well. It was a convenient way to communicate with other Blackberry users, so if you didn't have one, you weren't part of the conversation and sort of felt left out. In the following years, they released new models with updated features, but typically staying true to their iconic design and relying on the email and messaging capabilities that helped make them successful in the first place. By most financial measures, I think we can say that their biggest year was 2011. I'm just gonna put this all together so we can see the big picture, cause I don't know if I've ever seen a graph that tells the story so well. Almost 20 billion dollars in 2011 that was up from 1 billion dollars a few years earlier and back down below 1 billion dollars just a few years later. And then their net income or loss tells a similar story. Major profits in 2011 turned to major losses by 2014. So the big question here is what happened in 2011 that made everything go so bad for BlackBerry? I really do hate to simplify it this much, but I would go so far as to say that the biggest part of the rise and fall of BlackBerry is the keyboard. I've been hinting at it this whole time. Their biggest features, like the email and the BBM, were complemented by the full keyboard because it made things way easier than your typical phones on the market. It's what gave them their iconic look and it's where they got their name. They essentially built their entire brand around it. Well, I'm sure you knew that this was coming, but in 2007, Apple introduced the iPhone and whether you like it or not, it truly did change the game. Just think about that. One of the most successful products of our time was designed specifically specifically to improve upon BlackBerry's keyboard design. If you look at the presentation, the way Steve Jobs introduced it was by showing a photo of a BlackBerry and all these other BlackBerry looking devices and pretty much saying that the problem with those devices was the built-in keyboard and that the iPhone improves upon that. The problem with them is really sort of in the bottom 40 there. It's, it's this stuff right here. Now, the iPhone and that design in general did take a few years to catch on because it was so different that people were apprehensive. Do you remember all those debates about whether or not the touchscreen can ever fully replace the physical keyboard? And plus, the iPhone was only available at AT&T for the first few years, so if you were loyal to one of those other carriers, you weren't getting an iPhone. So there was an opportunity. If the people at Research in Motion had seen that presentation and took the iPhone as a real threat, they arguably had enough time to respond accordingly. Their biggest most direct response, as far as I'm concerned, was the BlackBerry Storm toward the end of 2008 that I think you'll agree looks more like an iPhone than a BlackBerry. It was their first ever touchscreen device that didn't have a physical keyboard, much like an iPhone, and it actually sold pretty well initially. Whoa. It has no keyboard. It was released through Verizon, so right there, all the loyal Verizon customers that couldn't buy AT&T's iPhone now had a touchscreen equivalent released by a trusted brand. The big issue with all of it was that it simply wasn't that great of a phone. They used this technology called SurePress for the screen, where you have to sort of click the screen by pressing harder. It was seen as more gimmicky than practical. Other complaints include that it used a worse browser when compared to Safari. It would lock up, run slow, it didn't have Wi-Fi support. It was also reported that most of them had to be replaced, so obviously the BlackBerry Storm wasn't fit to compete with the iPhone. Actually, the iPhone 3G had already been released at that point, with the hugely successful iPhone 4 right around the corner in 2010. That year, BlackBerry's share of the smartphone market started falling for the first time, and by 2016 it had fallen to a rounded off 0%. But remember now, the entire smartphone market was growing fast, so even though their share of it had already been falling 
falling steadily, 2011 was their highest selling year. The obvious problem there was that the iPhone sales were increasing way faster. 2011 was the first year that the iPhone surpassed them and, you know, it continues to get worse from there. And it wasn't just the keyboard. I also have to recognize that Apple and the other smartphone makers were beating BlackBerry when it came to the apps that were available and their appeal to the general public. This entire time, I've been talking about BlackBerry's focus on companies and business professionals. That's how they started and they never veered too far away from it. Smartphones in general were seen as being for practical, professional purposes, but the iPhone helped bring them to the general public for personal and entertainment reasons. BlackBerry never adjusted enough in that way and as a result, missed out on all of those potential customers. Even today, all of these years later, I would bet that most of the people watching this think of BlackBerry as more of a business phone. To finish it up, in 2013, recognizing how much they were struggling, the company made some big changes to try to turn things around. They almost sold the company altogether, but ultimately ended up with a new name and a new CEO. So in 2016, they did stop producing BlackBerry phones and have instead been collecting licensing fees from the other companies that have been doing it, and overall, they make most of their money through software and cybersecurity. In 2019, they spent over a billion dollars to acquire an artificial intelligence company, so they do still exist in a much different capacity and as a much smaller company overall. Let me know in the comments, have you ever owned a Blackberry? And if you have, I'm curious to know what years did you own it and whether or not it was for business purposes. It really is a crazy story. Not many companies rapidly grow into the multi-billion dollar range and then fall back down just as quickly. I don't want to say that the iPhone killed them directly, but I will say that the iPhone changed the game and BlackBerry failed to adopt to those new rules. Do you agree with that assessment or would you say that there's more to it? And any other thoughts you have about BlackBerry, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.